Another group of rats were fed natural potatoes, and a third group were fed natural potatoes spiked with the same insecticide that the genetically engineered potatoes were producing. So GM potatoes, natural potatoes, natural potatoes with the insecticide. Only the GM group got sick. What was the cause of the problem? What caused the potentially precancerous cell growth in the digestive tract, the smaller brains, livers, and testicles, the atrophy of the liver and the damaged immune system? What caused the intestinal walls on the rats on the right side of the photo to have such prolific cell growth or the stomach lining to look about double the size? It was not the insecticide. It was somehow the process of genetically engineering the potato. Now, Dr. Pustai went public with his concerns, was a hero for about two days at his prestigious institute, and then two phone calls were allegedly placed from the UK Prime Minister's office to the director of the institute. The next day, Dr. Pustai was fired from his job after 35 years, silenced with threats of a lawsuit. His 20-member research team was disbanded. They never implemented the long-term safety testing protocols. Instead, they mounted a campaign to trash his reputation. He since got the data back. It's published in The Lancet. And it implicates the process of genetic engineering as very dangerous. These problems occurred in 10 days. Now, one thing that was interesting about the potatoes was that they would have passed the assessments used around the world, even where they're required in the EU. The assessments done by industry are so poor, so superficial, that the potatoes would have made it to market. But the crops that are already on the market have never been tested in the ways for these things that the potatoes were tested for. So they may be creating the same problems because they were created from the same process. So this is the first possible cause of problems. The very process itself of genetically engineering a crop causes massive collateral damage and unpredicted side effects. So what is the process? Let's say you want to take corn and turn it into a registered pesticide. So you take a gene from soil bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis, or Bt. How many people use Bt on their garden or farm? It's used by organic gardeners. It's a natural pesticide. But they take the gene out of that pesticide. They make changes in it so that it'll work in crops. But they have to figure out a way to turn it on, because normally genes are self-regulating based on the needs of the cell. But they're ignoring the needs of the cell, so they put in a viral promoter, an on switch, that turns on that gene 24-7 around the clock to pump out that Bt toxin. They put an end switch at the very end, stop signal, saying to the cell, stop reading, the, the gene ends here. Then they make millions of copies of that gene construct and put it into a gun. And they shoot that gun into millions of cells, hoping that some of the genes make it into the DNA of some of those cells. You can't tell where it ends up. You can't even tell by looking at it if it got in there. So they need to figure out a way to, to figure out which ones, which one of the cells have the genes functioning. So before they make millions of copies, they add another gene into the gene construct. It's called an antibiotic-resistant marker gene. Its job is to produce a protein that renders the cell invincible to a normally deadly antibiotic. So after they shoot the genes into the cell, they add antibiotics, killing almost all of the cells except the very few that have the gene construct functioning inside the DNA because that has rendered the cell invincible to that antibiotic. Then they take those cells and they clone them into the corn plant that produces the Bt toxin. So it's a lot of things, but it's not natural. It's not sex. <laughs> and what it does is it causes unexpected changes in the DNA. Two to four percent of the DNA is different. 
as a result of the process of insertion and the cloning. And most of that is mutations. Hundreds or thousands of mutations up and down the DNA. Genes can also be deleted, permanently turned off, permanently turned on. And on top of that, the single insertion causes a holistic response where as much as 5% of the genes, the natural functioning genes in the plant, change. They change the levels of expression of the proteins they're producing. So we're talking about massive collateral damage. When you change the DNA, you change the RNA, which the DNA creates, you, cre you change the proteins, the proteins interact to create all these natural compounds which give the special qualities to a plant. Many of them can be increased, decreased, there could be new ones. And we don't test for them. They don't test for them. They test for a small handful of known nutrients, maybe one or two known toxins, and put it on the market, knowing that there may be hundreds of different compounds that have changed levels of expression or are new. So one example that was found accidentally was that soy and corn have higher levels of lignin after being genetically engineered. It's the woody component in trees and plants. But the metabolic pathway that produces lignin produces rotenone also, which is a known plant, plant pesticide, which may be a cause of Parkinson's disease. So if it creates more lignin, it might create more rotenone, it might create more Parkinson's disease, but we don't know it. It's just one of a myriad of things that can change as a result of the process. It is a genetic roulette. The second cause of problems is that the protein that they intend to be produced in the plant, what happens is, just to review the basic science, they put a gene into the plant so that the gene produces a protein and the protein has a trait that they consider desirable. So there are, that protein may be harmful. Now there are two primary traits. About 80% of all crops are designed not to die when sprayed with a particular herbicide. So here's how that worked. Monsanto found bacteria surviving in a chemical waste dump in the presence of the normally deadly Roundup, their herbicide. And they said, let's put it in the food supply. So they took the gene that produced the Roundup ready protein, allowing the bacteria to survive, and they put that gene into soy, corn, cotton, canola, and now sugar beets, so that when you spray the field with Roundup, you just kill all the other plant biodiversity in the field, not the Roundup ready crops. The, about the other 20% of the crops produce their own pesticide, Bt. Then there's a tiny percentage, those papaya, zucchini, and crookneck squash that have virus-resistant proteins. Now, viral proteins, it turns out, there's more than 100 studies that show that viral proteins can suppress the defense mechanism against viral infection. And they may also be toxic, interfering with things like the cell cycle, which might be cancerous. So the protein itself that's intended to be put into the product, in the case of these papaya, zucchini, and crookneck squash, might theoretically be causing us to be more susceptible to viral infection and cancer or other diseases. Now let's take a look at the Bt toxin and see if that has a problem. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, which registers the crops as official pesticides, the Bt is not a problem because it has a history of safe use among farmers, among forestry, organic farmers. They say the Bt toxin is destroyed during digestion and is completely benign to mammals anyway because we don't even have receptor cells for it. It would just pass through our system if it weren't destroyed during digestion. 